Hello everybody. We are about to get started. I am going to be streaming uh working on the advent of cyber year 2, I guess, the the 2020 edition, the current one. It's uh the 13th year or we're on day 12 still, I guess, but uh, I haven't started at all, so I've got a lot of catching up to do if I'm going to be able to get through all 25 of them before the end of, I assume it ends on Christmas, maybe they run it for the whole month, but if I'm going to get to 25 by day 25, I really need to uh, step up my, you know, <laughs> uh, do more than just one a day for sure so let's see how many of them we can get through uh on this particular uh stream and yeah we'll just uh just head into it i guess um one second i think i'm gonna put some music on on my side just so i have a little something going on but uh, it's not going to play on the stream i don't this music is not licensed so unlike the intro music um so i'm just going to have it on my headphones and you can listen to whatever music you want while you watch this okay advent of cyber 2020 Get started with cybersecurity in 25 days by learning the basics and completing a new beginner-friendly security exercise every day leading up until Christmas, an advent calendar, but with security challenges and not chocolate. So uh, this is cool. I'm quite familiar with this kind of structure for a computing-related challenge uh, because there's another one called Advent of Code, which is super popular for software developers because uh, it's all writing code to do a particular thing i haven't done it at all this year much like with advent of cyber i haven't done it um and yeah it, but I, I know a lot of people that are working on it so it's fun to watch them go through these challenges um i would wager that advent of code is like the um inspiration for advent of cyber but i i don't know for sure um and but the the idea is the same there's definitely there's various prizes uh i think probably i mean obviously the most useful i don't know what i n e cybersecurity is it's a course of some kind uh it's the one that's listed as the most valuable monetarily but i would imagine like actually getting the uh pen testing with Kali course and and uh the, o the oscp exam you know even though technically it costs less money that's probably the thing that people are most interested in that's probably why they list it first um okay so this is like a big training program you get lots of stuff um i certainly wouldn't be paying six thousand dollars for it i don't have that kind of money floating around um but i think having uh the proving grounds vouchers the try hack me subscription these are all pretty good um additional pot possibilities uh and i kind of like that it's done as a raffle rather than um like advent of code has i don't know if they actually have prizes but they have like um a way of scoring points to be on a leaderboard and you effectively have to complete the challenges within you know i mean by the time it gets to the end where they're very hard challenges it's probably within an hour or two but for the early ones we're talking like if you don't finish it within 15 or 20 minutes of it being posted on the internet so you gotta like be f5ing that page as much as possible um you're you're gonna be too late given the number of people that are working on it uh, to get any points for that particular challenge. So getting on the leaderboard on advent of code is quite difficult. Whereas getting some of these prizes 
you know, it it doesn't matter if you're kind of slow at it. If you do all of the stuff, you give yourself the same highest possibility of getting a prize as anybody else that does all of the stuff. So I like that it's a little more um, open for just, you know, beginners and people who are learning, which, as they say, this is a beginner-friendly security exercise. So uh, sponsored by various people. And these are like the main additional contributors. Um, I thought Darkstar worked for Try Hack Me, but maybe they're just like really involved because I'm pretty sure they've got a lot of rooms on Try Hack Me. John Hammond, I think I've probably talked about before. Uh, he's done some rooms, but he's also like, a, he does a lot of YouTube videos. He does a lot of CTF stuff. He's a great guy. So follow him on all the things on YouTube. This link goes to um and check out his videos they're certainly more put together and entertaining than my streams but uh also watch my stream and then uh cyber mentor does a lot of work uh in the community has his own courses and stuff um and certainly has contributed i think some of the boxes that i thought were most interesting and challenging that i've worked on for try hack me i haven't done a lot of try hack me stuff but the ones that i found like to be particularly challenging were uh i think at least one of them was from him so i like that and i don't know tiberius maybe i've done a box or a room rather uh that this person worked on but i don't know um the the image looks vaguely familiar but it might just be you know my memory kind of jumping to some conclusion based on it uh being the like roman statue um so okay so join the room and it looks like the first one is the first several are not actually challenges they're just things to uh join the discord yeah you should do that i, th I think i am i don't you know whatever you follow on twitter go on the subreddit cool um okay short tutorial Hey, Meowcat, how's it going, man? Uh, did I find a job in security? I Not yet. Um, I'm still out here in Thailand for the next couple months. My visa and my whole, like, my visa, my uh, apartment lease, um, and my school sort of registration, which is tied in with the visa, is all kind of ending in February. So... I think that's when I'm planning to head back to the U S uh, where I'll be trying to get a job. I'll probably be like focusing on the job search stuff before I head back. But you know, at this point in time, doing everything remote in terms of like a job application process is actually doable just because of the COVID situation. Um, but normally I would prefer to do the job hunt while I'm actually in, in country. Cause it's, I think I can do better in an interview scenario when it's not um, through Zoom or whatever. But uh, what was I thinking? Um, yeah, I mean, I I had sort of been telling myself, oh, if things, you know, I, I kind of want to wait out until things are better in terms of like how COVID is in the U.S. because it's it's not really an issue here in Thailand at all. So I'm in a pretty convenient spot for that, but um, there's no sign that things are going to get better in the U S uh, absent the wide availability of a vaccine, which is like May, June at the super earliest and most likely actual wide availability to the point where it like impacts on people's um just like whether or not I would, you know, it would be more chill to just go out on any given day um, is like maybe, you know, the end of next year. So like, I'm not going to, I can't wait that long basically. So I'm probably just going to go back on my original schedule and that'll be that. Um, yeah, no worries. Wondering. Um, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> uh you know, I'm still trying to use this time to, to learn stuff. Uh, and I've got some like contract work related to my software development 
uh, career previously that's, you know, keeping me going. But, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Um, and this hopefully, hopefully, uh, I will, uh, the like advent of cyber thing here is going to get me back into regularly streaming because obviously i mean i didn't address it at the beginning of the stream but i took like a i don't know a five or six month break or something like it's been quite a while since i've done any streams um and i think that's sort of like kind of par for the course for me of like if i fall out of the habit of doing something and then i don't easily jump back into it so i'm hoping to get back into the habit of it and keep that going um but we'll see if something comes up and then i get distracted for a while but i'm going to do my best to at least do all the stuff for advent of cyber so now through christmas basically um and then there's more than enough stuff to work on outside of this um i've got a ton of like uh do i have them here um i mean obviously i could go back to the nightmare challenge stuff i haven't done more on that so i've got a lot there but I, i've found some other courses that are like specific to heap exploitation vm uh exploitation stuff like so obviously there's no shortage of like content to work on uh now okay, you're watching watching George Hotz. Yeah, I love watching his streams. Um for the most part. I mean I'm more I'm certainly more interested when he's streaming about security stuff or um you know, just generally like things in the computer area. He did a bunch of streams about investigating um coronavirus and like I don't really get it. And I didn't watch many of those streams because that was more on the like medical side of things i don't know it, that wasn't as interesting so i didn't watch a lot of those streams but in general if he streams something i'm i try to pop in and see uh what he's doing because i he is like really very talented at this stuff even if he doesn't do it that much anymore um anytime he's willing to i'm, I'm down for it basically uh so yeah he's a good person to watch on stream and he can be pretty entertaining um Okay, so short tutorial, access to target machines. Uh, okay, so I think this is like, if you've never done anything on TryHackMe, and maybe add on to cyber is part of their like sort of general marketing kind of thing of trying to get more people onto the TryHackMe platform. So this is oriented a little bit. It's, you know, people that maybe have never done anything with TryHackMe. Um it just, you know, is like, okay, you can, here's how to actually use the platform. So that's cool. Um, someone recommended me that, but I'm not, the, the nightmare course, someone recommended it to you, uh, but you're not sure if that could help in a job. That's sort of like also one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of like getting a better understanding of. So me trying to transition into InfoSec, the biggest thing I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff to learn, but the, like, learning new stuff about computers is pretty, like, I've done that for many, many years. So as much as it is work to do, it's not, like, confusing. Um, the bigger, more confusing thing was, like, trying to understand how all of these jobs fit together and the careers and stuff. Because all I've done is, like, build software, which exists in one spot, and then there's, like, you know, information security sort of touches up against that but like there's a lot of software jobs where it just never comes into play even to the extent that like thinking about security of the products you're making um but let alone you know the people who are like managing it for the organization or co contractors coming in to pen test the network of the company that you work at any of that stuff like was not really like something i was cognizant of so a big part of this year and I guess some of the year of 2019 as well has just been like trying to realize what are the, what are the different roles available? What are the skills that play into those roles? And, you know, how are these things that I can work on relevant to those skills? So the, with the nightmare course, it's like, okay, there's definitely a particular variety of jobs where that 
information, having some facility with that um, is helpful. I would say broadest scope um, would include like malware analysis because if you understand the actual mechanisms used to uh, exploit certain kinds of vulnerabilities, then you'll have a better time reversing some piece of code that's, you know, usually like an exploit piece of code is not super similar to the standard code that's been compiled because it's often written by hand in assembly or something. And like, it's usually a very, a very like custom crafted kind of thing. Um, but it, it really helps to know what the goal is. And if you understand how a thing might be, uh, might be exploited, then you're better off understanding what the goal of a particular piece of malware is at the exploit level. There's obviously layers above that of like, you know, doing persistent stuff, doing like communications with the C2 servers and, and et cetera. Um, but one part of that, you know, understanding how the malware got on the system, how it actually, you know, that, that entry point or whatever, um, being able to analyze that can be, it can be helpful to know how to do it on the, for yourself, right? To build software that does that. Um, but mostly I would say the skills that you might learn in Nightmare One, you're right that like the specific things that you're doing in these CTF challenges aren't like, you're not probably gonna have a real world challenge that is that simple as what you see in a CTF. There's a lot more to vulnerability uh, research. And this is just like uh, the end goal. Um, so you want to do malware analysis. I would say like more I'm interested in vulnerability research work um, where the Nightmare Core stuff is a part of it, but it's like what I'm, you know, be what I've come to understand more and more is that that's really like the last layer. <laughs> One, the biggest part of vulnerability research is finding the vulnerability, right? And in these CTF challenges that make up the nightmare course, they've done everything possible to make the vulnerability as obvious as possible. And they do that by making it a program that has basically no code other than the vulnerable thing. So then you are left wondering how is it vulnerable? And maybe they make it very um in some cases very unnatural uh so it's a more challenging thing to realize what's vulnerable or and then also to figure out how to write something to exploit that vulnerability but i think um from what i have gathered really the biggest challenges are taking a huge piece of software uh you know many like a hundred or a thousand times larger than any of these ctf challenges or ten thousand or whatever you know especially if you're looking at like a browser like chrome uh and finding even a one particular vulnerability and then figuring out well how can we even get to the point where we could provide some data that would exploit that vulnerability and the last layer is then okay now that we are in that position let's you know maybe write a proof of concept that shows how that can be exploited or if you're in the sort of like if you're in a position where you can actually write offensive software in a legal way in whatever context you're in then you know you can go ahead and write a much more more than just a proof of concept kind of vulnerability and that certainly is interesting to me but i don't know that i'm ever going to be in the position where i'm like allowed to do that outside of just do it for fun on my own and, and not release it. Um, but that's just, again, it's still in this, like the last 10% of the process kind of situation. And what I need to be focusing my efforts more on, I think are that first 90%, especially the, like, uh, if given a target, how to section off pieces of that target that are, perhaps most interesting to look at because if you if you're like okay i want to find a bug in chrome i mean there's so much code in that project and not all of it's going to be worth looking at and so what you find well you know researchers do is like okay i'm going to just focus on javascript 
for one, the JavaScript engine. And then even within that, I'm going to focus on this particular element within the JavaScript engine, which is still a huge amount of code, but it's nowhere near the full scope of the browser. So part of it is just, you know, be, being able to narrow your focus down. And then, you know, it's the code review aspect of things, usually, along with fuzzing and, and, and static analysis tools and stuff. And there's definitely you know, a lot of research and practice I need to do in that area. So what I, the nightmare challenges are fun because they get you to the like, okay, let's exploit something and we're, you know, minutes away, so to speak, or, or you know, we're, we're, mo we're only a few steps away from getting uh, a result that is I control this program. Whereas the real world, you start many, many, many steps away from that. Uh, so it's fun to do the nightmare challenge and there's some value, but you're right that it's like, that's not usually what people are hiring for is the ability to write an exploit for a given vulnerability. It's really the like find the vulnerabilities is the, where the value is. Um, and it would be nice if there were more CTF challenge kind of things they wouldn't really work in a ctf but maybe like a war game kind of thing but just basically like things that were built with the intention of helping you practice and learn how to do the vulnerability uh finding um because i think if you just pick a piece of software in the real world and that's that's you know probably what i need to do because i unfortunately have not been spending enough time practicing that um is just pick a piece of software and um and just go at it but it definitely like to start from that point where you, there you don't have if your skills aren't great yet and you don't have a lot of experience finding bugs um to go that route, you need to just fake a lot of confidence that you're going to find something because there's no evidence to say that you will be able to find something. And whether and the the biggest thing for me is like if you don't find something, is that because you didn't apply techniques well enough or or something to actually find the vulnerabilities that are there, or are there not vulnerabilities in the places where you looked, or of the sort of vulnerability that you were looking for in the places you, where you were looking. It's, it could be either, it could be both of those things. Like, um, and so that's a difficult, like just for a learning sake, if you have difficulty learning something, the best position to be in is where that difficulty can be analyzed to come to a conclusion about what you need to do differently. But if it's like tied up in this thing that you don't understand, uh, whether or not, you know, it basically like, if you try to solve a puzzle and you don't know if you're missing any pieces in that puzzle, <laughs> um, it, it, it can be difficult as a learning experience because you don't know if it's because you don't know how to solve the puzzle or because the pieces were missing. Uh, I think need to find, you need to, uh, sorry. I think to find bugs, you need to use fuzzers. I think that's becoming more and more true. Um, not necessarily partially because there's like better mitigations and better, you know, production of code that would, um, not have as obvious bugs perhaps, but I think mainly because finding bugs is generally a competitive process in that, you know, other people are going to be looking for bugs in the same thing potentially. And if they're using, if they're integrating fuzzers into their process, that's going to give them a leg up on you. So in any sort of competitive environment, you need to be using all the tools at your disposal or the person that is will be uh, outpacing you in whatever the competition is. But I don't think it's, it's not a necessarily a case of like, okay, we, it needs to be a fuzzer based approach. 
or like fuzzing first. All the advice that I've gotten, even from like, um, if you don't watch his streams, I would recommend you check him out. Uh, Gamozo, um, he's gotten more popular recently on Twitch. Um, he does tons and tons of work with fuzzers. Like that's his core thing for by a long shot is working on fuzzers to find vulnerabilities. And even he says like, you need to integrate it with the the manual analysis because if you take the really like simplistic route um uh if you take the simplistic route and you like just say okay i've got this program let me you know just like set up afl and try to send some random inputs to it that's that's not going to get you very far. It's not going to get you further than uh, anybody else who is also putting in that same sort of initial level of work. Um, so it's very unlikely to find you bugs because they will have already been found if they existed and could be found through that process. What you need to do is do the more advanced investigation reverse engineer it or do a code review if it's open source or something to find an area within that program that seems most likely to have a bug even if you don't identify a very clear vulnerability just from the manual analysis you might find an area um, or a code path or something that seems that feels to you like it might have a bug in it just by like what it's doing um, or or maybe it's doing something that is like important enough that if there was a vulnerability it would be very problematic so you then you build a fuzzer or tailor your fuzzing work to that section of the program and then you're in a much better position so a combination of the two effectively and i'm you know sort of talking not from a position of experience here but um a, a combination of all of those things seems like the way to go for vulnerability research at this point in time um so yeah uh you're curious about it but you think you want to work as a programmer not do cyber work i mean that may you know i get it for sure <laughs> uh i still love doing programming and like yeah i don't know <laughs> i think for me the like the move towards this kind of thing is um wanting to vary stuff up from from the experience that I have already doing programming and like looking at the landscape of like tech companies and um, places that I might apply to places where some of my former students are working now and just going like ah, the, the things they work on just don't seem that interesting to me anymore or at least right now um, a lot of web services kind of stuff just doesn't like excite me as it maybe did previously um, so then I figured, you know, look, InfoSec sounds like it's got a lot of cool stuff that's still new to me. Um, so, you know, go for the programming stuff and then, you know, just sort of like, I don't know, be open, basically, um, to whatever might become interesting to you later or, you know, the, the more you follow programming, the more you might find a different kind of interest in cybersecurity or, or you might just like not find an interest in it you know you might lose your interest in it i think it's all um it's all good uh you're not distracting me i mean i'm streaming i think i prefer to have somebody in chat <laughs> to talk to uh than like just do a stream to nobody and then you know maybe somebody will see it if i post it on youtube later or something um but we will we'll move into Working on this. Uh, okay, you can subscribe if you want. Did I not click? Okay, I missed the introduction one. All right, so there's a story. Um, I guess I'll read the story. After last year's shenanigans, where Elf McElpherson and Elf McSkitty were on damage control mode the entirety of December, McSkitty vowed to never let that happen again. The previous Christmas period was extremely stressful with the Christmas monster hanging, managing rather, uh, to compromise every system within Santa's corporate infrastructure to prevent Christmas from happening. 
Is Christmas still in danger this year? McSkitty showed great promise with the previous incident and was tasked with building up a security team within Santa's company, the best festival company. Due to resistance from management, budgeting, and bureaucracy issues, due to resistance from management, budgeting, and bureaucracy issues, McSkitty was only able to start building out her team from the 8th of November. Since then, she's hired only two team members, one security specialist, Elf McHacker, and one intern, Elf McEager. All right, these names are already going to be confusing. I hope they're not that important. <laughs> uh, it's the evening of the 30th of November. McSkitty's team has been working hard to prevent any downtime and security incidents within the entire network and application stack uh, within the entire network and application stack of the best festival company. McHacker suggested installing a VPN and only allowing access to the infrastructure via the VPN. Seems like a good like that's a good advice. Um, don't just have you know SSH ports open to any anybody, even even though SSH is like a you know need to be authorized to do anything with it kind of service. It's still probably better to have the as a VPN basis. Um, after a long eight-hour installation and deployment, McSkitty opens her monitoring dashboard and notices that no traffic is flowing to any of the applications. This was expected as no one had access to the VPN. Thank God, she said, getting hacked again is not an option. Okay. I guess, you know, from the network analysis standpoint, having no network traffic makes for a very easy analysis. Uh, ring, ring, ring. Her elf hotline starts ringing and she jumps. Santa's schedule isn't working. I can't see anything, says Elf McExistent. Within a matter of seconds, hundreds of phone calls come in and Elf McSkitty gets that sinking feeling in her stomach. She quickly dispatches McHacker to analyze the VPN logs. He notices a payload that resembles a VPN authentication bypass that allows anyone to bypass the VPN. Did someone install the wrong version? With the poor state of security across the entire network, this unknown actor managed to access all applications and their underlying servers. Unlike last time, no one has claimed responsibility for this incident. Here we go again, she sighs. It's up to you, you are Elf McEager, and the rest of the team to save Christmas. Please note, tasks are released daily and will vary in difficulty, although they'll always be aimed at a beginner level. So that's one difference from Admin of Code, where they do start off fairly beginner-oriented, or at least... The problems are just simpler. Um, I wouldn't say that the the end problems are necessarily something a beginner, beginner couldn't do. They're just more involved, so they're going to take longer. Um, if these are all beginner oriented, there might not be that kind of ramp up as the days go through, um, which is interesting. Just as a you know, as a note on the differences. Uh, okay. So the story is used in some of the tasks, so it's good that we read it. Um, I feel like this the VPN thing. So I said earlier, it's probably better to have like a VPN, you know, sort of layer in your security architecture where you need to be VPN in in order to get access to any of the other internal services. I still think that's true, but as we can see in this story, and has actually been the case in some real world. VPN applications, they aren't necessarily completely free of vulnerabilities either. So if you can exploit the VPN software um, pre-authentication, then that that's potentially more vulnerability vulnerable than if you had, you know, direct access to your services. Depending on what those services are, if all your services were just SSH. Um, and you're running maybe open SSH or something, then a vulnerable VPN is probably more vulnerable than the open SSH installation because open SSH is also, you know, well tested. And so, um, it, not that it has no, uh, vulnerabilities, but, or hasn't in the past. And, it, you know, probably there are some still in there, um, it might be more hardened than your VPN, basically, depending on which VPN software you're using, whether or not you're installing the right version, that kind of thing. Um, you're interrupted randomly like audio issues, and then it continues. Interesting. Um, let me 
check. I'm going to listen to myself on the Twitch stream for a second. does show like the bitrate thing is red but it's showing a bitrate of like 2400 which isn't terrible um i don't know i don't know where the uh audio issues are coming from if if you're getting them um it says it's unstable so maybe it yeah the network has been sort of popping in and out. Um, apologies for that. I'm I'm recording it locally, so if uh, if it gets to the point where you can't keep watching it because it's uh, too distracting or or too difficult to follow because of the audio issues, one my apologies. Um, I don't know what's causing that or or what I can necessarily do to fix it if it's just a network issue. Um, but I'll post this video uh on youtube i guess um let me link my youtube um channel slash is that gonna work no i don't know i'll find the <laughs> my youtube channel at some point um doo -doo -doo. i look on my channel like this in the chat um and so i'll post it up there and it shouldn't have any audio issues on the local recording uh at the very least but hopefully it clears up thanks for letting me know um and if you have any ideas of how i can troubleshoot it um i'd certainly be happy to look into that um is it when you say interrupted randomly like how frequently is it like every like 10 seconds, every minute or two, um, is it still happening? Let me know. And I, I'm gonna be posting all my old stream videos on the YouTube eventually as well. Um, still listed as unstable network connection. I don't know what I can do about that, unfortunately. Because I just have the internet that I have. Um, it's, uh, there was one unstable event earlier, but that wouldn't explain the audio issues. It's, it's definitely up and down a little bit in the, the bit rate, but not like, like 0.5% up and down. Hmm. Um, okay. So, we're gonna continue on with uh we got through the story as i was saying like the vpn here seems to be at least part of the problem one the way that they deployed it um wasn't necessarily very coordinated with their users so the assistant trying to use the schedule application can't see anything presumably because now they need to be logged into the vpn and they aren't um, but then also the version that they deployed perhaps uh, was vulnerable. Maybe there was an end day of some kind. There's a known vulnerability there and an attacker got in even before any of their users could get on the system. So let's find out. All right. Oh, wow. All of these are long explanations. Um, okay. Maybe this is like, this is a basic explanation of how the web works, parts of the web. So I don't think we need to read through all of that. Let's read through this starting material. The best festival company's brand new open VPN server has been hacked. This is a crisis. The attacker has damaged various aspects of the company infrastructure, including the Christmas control center to shut off the assembly line. It's only 24 hours until Christmas, and that line has to be operational or there won't be any presents. You have to hack your way back into Santa's account 
blast that hacker changing the password. Oh, I see. Blast that, like, darn that hacker for changing the password. So we have to hack our way into the system, uh, into our own system. Cool. And getting the assembly line up and running again, or Christmas will be ruined. All right. After giving you the assignment, McSkitty hands you the following dossier of important information for the task. Before reading it, you press the big green deploy button to start the control center. Um, all right, let's actually get into doing some triacme challenges then. Uh, all right, so we gotta hit the deploy button. Uh, and then I think we, we can just skip down to here because I, I'm not going to cover, uh, yes, thank you, Malcat. I see the thumbs up is, uh, I means that the stream is working better for you now. So glad to hear it. Um, thanks for letting me know. And, you know, uh, I should, you know, make an effort to make sure that my streams are, uh, working for the people that are watching because it's, you know, otherwise I could just do this on my own <laughs> if it wasn't, if I weren't concerned about the people watching. All right. I'll hit the deploy um that'll take a few minutes uh oh cool okay that went pretty quickly it's going to show the address to me in a minute though so we're going to skip the information about https and cookies uh hey Ferna carl how's it going man yeah of course i remember um i'm surprised you remember me because it's been so long <laughs> since i've done any streaming but uh yeah, we're going to try to do this advent of cyber stuff um, that TriHackMe has. And then if I if I get back into the rhythm of streaming, I'll I'll maybe stream some other stuff I'm trying to work on. Uh, been looking at like writing a emulator for Risk 5 to eventually put towards like the the um, eventually working on fuzzers kind of thing. Um but I like the idea of writing an emulator and risk five is an interesting architecture and certainly a simpler one to build on than uh, x86. And, and yeah, um, you know, some pwn stuff for sure. Like that's all the stuff that I was doing before basically. Um, so getting back into the nightmare course, I think would be fun because there's still a bunch of uh, all the heap exploitation stuff is still yet to be done. I haven't gone back to it in the months between now i haven't like been working on it and not streaming it so nobody missed anything um but i haven't really progressed with it so it'd be good to get back into that as well all right so having read the lengthy dossier you get ready to hack your way back into santa's christmas control center you enter the ip at the address at the top of the screen into your browser search bar and press the enter to load the page okay and all right we could do the attack box but i'm not going to i think that's just my preference to not use their kali vm through the web setup um okay so we need to register an account Um, let's call this oh, these are all in one room huh. okay um, so this is just AOC 2020 that's what I'm going to call that and box is this It's still nothing. Make sure my VPN connection is still working. So I might have been disconnected from it since I, I started it before I started the stream and it's been almost an hour since getting to the beginning to the actual first box. Uh, it still says I'm connected, so that's good. Yeah not 
hitting that machine at all. I guess they say it can take five minutes to load it up. I really need to remember to just hit deploy as soon as I switch to a task so that I can do the reading while it's actually deploying the machine. Um, I guess, you know, while it's doing that, we can actually read some of this. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. as hackers, it is vital that we understand exactly what the web is and how it works. Um, and it is, it's basically like a sleigh being pulled by reindeer is my understanding. So when you open your web browser and navigate to a website, it seems so simple, but what's really happening behind the scenes? First of all, your computer communicates with a known DNS server to find out where the website can be found on the internet. Sure, I mean, in our case, it's not because we are given an IP address, but that will set that aside. The DNS server will then return an IP address for the remote server. This can be used to go directly to the website you can think of the internet as being quite like the planet itself. We have lots of locations all over the world. Okay, sure. These places all have a street address. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I'm reading this like I'm like being hypercritical of their explanation. Uh, it's probably better to have a intuitive, you know, a, a explanation that relies on people's existing knowledge. Oh, all right, now we got it. Let's get in there. Christmas Control Center. Uh, let's register new. Oh, okay. That's not a separate page. We registered, right? Did we not register? Uh, I wasn't recording. Okay. Do we have a cookie? No cookies. Let's log in. Why is none of thing happening? All right, there we go. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. So it's called auth, and there's my cookie. So if you want to. I think it's only going to work if you get into the VPN that I'm in, so I don't care that I'm showing you the the actual value. This is the format the value is encoded in. Is it base64? No, that's hexadecimal. Hexadecimal. All right, having decoded the cookie, what format is the data stored in? Okay. Uh, Python bytes that from hex stored in JSON. There we go. Why? All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no security on it, so it's fine. I don't know why I was expecting like a HMAC or something. What is the value of Santa's cookie? Okay. Can we? So when we did, what is the login JS code? Log out. Page has no sources, but it downloaded a login JS. But there's no, all right, let's just look at it here. Oh, Jesus Christ. They've encoded the shit out of this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that this is not what they want me to be looking at if it's beginner challenge. So set that aside. Yeah. Um, okay, so why don't we change our cookie? Uh, can we... They're simple Python to convert the string let's just write it out okay 
So we've got the JSON string for a user called Santa, and we just need to hex encode it. Um, Now I'm trying to remember my Python. Get. I don't want the prefix on any of these. We can't say Oh, just uh, dot x. Okay. Oops. There we go. So I think this is the answer that they want. Cool. Um, okay, and then we need to actually change the cookie. So we can go into storage to log in. Again, is Santa? No. It is. Uh... Right. Yeah, that should be like Santa in there. Um. All right. So. Why doesn't it work? Mm. Can we just try it and change? Edit and resend. And just change it here. Just using the poor man's version of burp, I suppose. Okay, uh, but we don't see it in the browser, but I think we can, no. No, we just get the login. So what, uh, what has gone wrong here? It just comes back with a 302. Hmm. Same thing, but with the text for Santa in there instead. Hmm. All right, what am I missing here? looks right to me. Does it need to be a lowercase Santa? But I mean, it accepted this as the correct answer. So... There's nothing I can click here. Presumably if I log in as Santa, then I'll have a button or whatever that does the thing for that final uh, task. Hmm. That is quite curious. Why changing the token doesn't work there. Um,
So we do the login attempt. It's going to have my password in there, and that's when we get the cookie set. But Um, yeah, that is just so curious. All right, so let's log out, make sure we're logged out, and then can we just paste in our cookie? Like uh, Santa's in here, fifty three, sixty one, blah blah blah. Okay, so then we just request. Yeah, and it's still. What if we request to like slash login? Did it unset the cookie from that? No, it doesn't look like it. Oh, it did? Can I add a cookie? What is this? So confused about the cookie situation here. I might just have to do this on the browser or in curl or something. I like, yeah. I feel like I shouldn't be having this this level of difficulty. Um, On this challenge but this is what it is maybe the fact that I'm trying to do it in the browser and avoid using like burp which I don't even know if I have it installed um, oh what is this check flag request not authorized to be the flag so if we do if we like edit and resend just paste in the cookie there. No, still. Right. Nope. Uh, it, why did it only copy a portion of the thing? It does say Santa. Am I? Is there like some obvious thing that I'm missing here? This is. Not what I was hoping for, to be honest. Santa, right? Like, let's try it with a lowercase s, I suppose.
Not all services are started. Okay, so it does need to be a lowercase s. So that's the issue. I don't know. It's very weird to me. So I thought about that earlier. I was like, oh, maybe it needs to be a lowercase s because they say Santa user here and they have a lowercase s. But the fact that it accepted it with the uppercase s on this one, when those are going to be two different hex codes, like we can find it in here. Um, 53, 61... So this is the A, 61 is the A, so S-A-N-T-A. -A. And the 53 comes before the 61, it's, it's a uppercase letter. So it definitely accepted that, so that's a little bit unusual to me. Um, but it is what it is. Am I logged in? No. Okay, so let's log in. Uh, maybe some portions of the site don't require that. All right, so we're gonna delete this. I'm gonna copy in this one, which, as we can see, is a 36, not a 56. Or sorry, uh, a 73. Yeah, 73, not 53. Um, hey, mail cat, you gotta go. Okay. Thanks for stopping by, man. I really, I was honestly not expecting anybody to show up on this first stream back after like six months of not streaming. So I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, feel free to check out the YouTube channel. Um, I will be trying to post all those other old videos as well on the off chance that somebody wants to see them. Uh, I feel like, you know, maybe just for the, the job search purposes, it's good to have like try to build up this catalog since I don't really have any blog posts to speak of at this point. Um, that would be another avenue to go with to uh, have a kind of portfolio to point at, even though I don't have work experience. Um, but in the meantime, I've got these streams that I've done. So if somebody wants to watch and see, oh, you know, this guy can do some amount of reverse engineering or whatever, um, that can work. Okay, so... We need the assembly line back on. I think we probably need to start all the services. Cool, and then it just prints it, yeah. Okay. And there we go. Usernames are often all lowercase. I mean, that's Eh, questionable certainly the account names in a unix or linux system are lowercase i don't want to i don't think we should uh you know go beyond that let's say all right um and if it's all lowercase then why does it accept the uppercase whatever all right so we are going to hit deploy because we know it's going to take some number of minutes before the box is actually available. And then we'll set up the IP address when it's ready to show us. All right, so day two. After your heroic deeds regaining control of the control center yesterday, Elf McSkitty has decided to give you an important job to do. We know we've been hacked, so we need a way to protect ourselves. The dev team have set up a website for the elves to upload pictures of any suspicious people hanging around the factory. Oh, a little Big Brother program. You got the, like, if you see something, say something uh, energy going around. Cool. <laughs> but it, it's like... You go to work and you see a poster and it's like, security is everybody's job or whatever. Basically, always be suspicious of everybody around you at all times. Because if you aren't suspicious of other people, then you might trust them. And if you trust other people, you might work together with other people. And that can't happen. We need everybody to be an isolated island of constant suspicion of all other human beings. Uh, but we need to make sure it's secure before we add it to the public network. Okay. Please perform a security audit on the new server and make sure it's unhackable. 
You listen to the briefing and accept the task, pressing the deploy button to start the server as you do. Mixkitty once again gives you a dossier of useful information to help you with your task, which you read as you wait for the server to boot. Oh, see, they're telling me what I should do. I gotta hit that and then spend more than five minutes reading through this. So that will hide the latency in booting these machines. Okay, so we've got get parameters in web URLs. That is for sure a thing. You can upload files and we've got reverse shell. So we're gonna get like a PHP reverse shell. Um, and then we're gonna listen to it. You can go ahead and do interpreter, I guess. At the bottom of the dossier is a sticky note containing the following message. For Elf McEager, you have been assigned an ID number for your audit of the system. It's this. You use this to gain access to the upload section of the site. Good luck. Please note down the ID number and navigate to the IP address. For sure. All right. Um, so this is the box that we're on. And we don't need that anymore. Let's go to that page. And still loading. Okay. So let's look at the questions. Or at least let's look at the first question because I feel like I, I will definitely get spoiled sometimes if I read the questions too far ahead. So what string of text needs to be added to the URL to get access to the upload page? Interesting. Um, I wonder if this is a thing that we need to guess or if it'll be obvious from whatever we see when we go to the site. But there is some uh, something that we need to add to the URL. It'll either be additional parts of the path or it will be uh, query parameters as they're talking about up here. Probably it is part of the query string parameters um maybe we should uh do an interpreter what is it it's been so long um msf console and we'll run venom to generate for ourselves a A little PHP reverse shell. Upload that and then. Oh, I see. I need to add that with the ID in there. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, Vinay. Um, do you know HTML? I, I do, or at least I have used HTML to build websites before, web pages, websites, all of that good stuff. Um, so yeah, I've, I've worked with HTML in my past. We can, uh, view some HTML right here. In fact, this is, uh, okay. All right. They got a lot of HTML going on for the, uh, for the snowflakes. And I have worked with CSS. Yeah. I mean, I would say I'm more comfortable with HTML than CSS as a, I'm more of the like software developer minded person and and css is one of these things that i sort of struggle with to get something hacked together that it works rather than be in the position of like okay here's what i want to do i know how to write to css to make that happen um it it doesn't speak to me on an intuitive level like other programming languages i would say but i have worked with it for sure all right so we've got our id code um and we need to say question mark ID equals slash question mark ID equals. Is that what I need to put in there? Is my, oh, my internet died. Okay. That's um, not ideal. 
All right, the stream is going. So let's see if that answer was actually correct. Do I need to reload the page? All right, and I lost that, submit it. Cool, so that was correct. So there we go. Okay, so now we are in the factory and we can upload a file. So let's generate one. Forget how to use MSF Venom again. Um, let's look at the PHP payloads that are available to us and let's get a interpreter reverse TCP. All right, so that'll be our payload um, format is PHP and I don't think we need to care about architecture. We're not going to encode it in any way. Output is going to be um, day two rev shell dot php and I think we need to set stuff like oh, what is it options there we go um, l host is equal to thm local what do we do here that's not a thing I can specify for format I guess okay let's just skip specifying it that way then This is our IP address, host. So, or just run rather. No. Um, what do I need to do? Uh, what do I forgetting? Um, is it not called run? You don't run Meterpreter for six months and I you forget everything. Well, at least I do. Okay, let's just look it up. Let's see. Yeah, that's how you would put like um, ba -ba -ba. okay. Is this one since I've been here before? Generate it. All right. Yeah. We'll use the default port, I guess. Uh, and then. Oh, right. Use XP. 
exploit slash what was it? Multi handler. Okay. Um gonna wait for the connection from the reverse shell so let's go to projects and try hack me do I need to call it no let's just see if we can upload it without the right extension invalid extension okay fair enough um, Hmm. It's probably what? Oh, Jesus Christ. Yes, they have no previous dots. All right. So I'm going to look in maybe slash uploads. There we go. Okay, but now. Oh, uh, it's probably a dumb check. I say dumb check, but like. Maybe we can do it that way. So it's like, how am I going to get it to. There we go. All right. We've got some interpreter shell going. What? What is this? It's still loading. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So we get it loaded. But doesn't want to let me run any commands, huh? Wonder if we should use the non staged one. Um, what did we say before? Just use. Oh yeah, yeah. I just run. I don't need to actually specify the specific, right? Oh no, I need to. I think I'm forgetting something here. Do we need to set payload? That's what it is. Okay. So we probably. Could have used the staged one. Oh, we've already uploaded. So let's go ahead and just whatever. Okay. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, Ooh. 
Lots of IDs. Uh, what are we looking for? Oh, image files, I guess. And then uploads. And it's just at flag txt. Okay. So that was nice, you know, upload a little uh, river shell, get that going. There we go. Now I remember mildly how to do stuff with Meterpreter. Uh, so that's an improvement, I guess. All right. Let's see if we can... Um, I'm going to just keep going. Maybe is that a download file or something? Yeah. Interesting. Maybe this is like review uh, PCAP file or whatever it's called. Recording of network traffic. We talk about Wireshark, so probably let me analyze that. I've done like none of these kind of CTF challenges, so that'll actually be pretty fun. Um, well, let's see if we can get through all the web exploitation stuff today and then maybe tomorrow we will work on some networking ones. All right, so let's deploy day three. Uh, McSkitty is walking down the corridor and hears a faint beeping, bleeping noise. Uh, beep, beep, beep. As McSkitty gets closer to Slay Engineering Room, the faint noise gets louder and louder. Beep, beep. That's... I'm not actually going to be louder, but you can imagine it. Uh, something is clearly wrong. Skitty runs to the room, slamming open the door to see Santa's sleigh's control panel light up in red error messages. Santa's sleigh, it's been hacked. Code red, code red, he screams as he runs back to the elf security com command center. Can you help McSkitty and his team hack into Santa's sleigh to regain control? So now, hmm, I thought McSkitty... This woman. Yeah. Skitty was only able to start building out her team. Since then, she's... Whatever. Set that aside. Um, okay. And... Understanding authentication, understanding the use of default credentials and why they're dangerous. Bypass a login form using Burp Suite. Interesting. Uh, maybe we will have to use Burp Suite, maybe not. Oh, uh, yeah. So they have some examples of like, people getting paid for actually using just default credentials, finding that a service used default credentials on something. My opinion, and this is just me, but. Um, I feel like default credentials is going to be one of these lower paid things, right? This one was $250 for this bounty. If they were able to get in with those default credentials and the things that they were able to access were high value, then I think the payout should be higher, even though it's not like, um, a vulnerability that's going to be super widespread necessarily um, because those credentials won't necessarily work on every machine right but or every system that they have um, if you only need to access that one system to get in and have control over something very high value whether it be the actual data or a mechanism by which you can control access or otherwise give yourself access to other high value data like $250 isn't necessarily um, appropriate in my view. I think it should be higher. But at the same time, I don't know about the details of this case. Maybe, you know, it was not getting them access to some really um, high value assets within the thing. Um, I'm assuming DoD didn't uh, disclose how much they paid. Yeah. 
but they did control they did consider it critical so hopefully that was a high paying one um and they have uh redacted something or other in there okay so we can also use burp suite uh to do dictionary attacks um yeah okay so we're gonna do a dictionary attack i think i can use hydra for that without having to use burp suite So let's just say we did that. Um, oh, they just give you, okay. So we don't need to, I guess this one is like, you're not really, it doesn't matter to, uh, to try to use like a nice word list or something. Um, let's say, um, or this day three user word list. So the usernames are root admin and user. Uh, and okay. we'll put in the passwords as root password and one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so let's see if I can remember. Yeah, so it's just dash H. Okay. And we, there is somewhere in here where they mention like how to get more specific help for a particular category usage details. So Hydra and then dash U for HTTP form post probably. Um, Cause I don't know what the login process is here. Yeah, so it's a post form. And this is the format, username equals and password equals. Okay. So we can do Hydra with um, dash L day three user word list dash P uh, day three password list and then HTTP colon colon IP slash login And then does it not say anything in the response? Um, it'll always say this though, huh? What am I looking for in the response? 
I'm pretty sure. Test, test. Oh, it does display a thing for a fraction of a second. But the problem is that stuff is always <sighs> okay. So let's see if the condition string. Is there no Hydra THC Hydra? What is the status code? Still 200 okay. So, I mean, pr the, the thing that is gonna make this difficult for Hydra, at least it seems like, is the fact that it doesn't present a page that has different page content. The body of the response is gonna be the same each time. It's whether or not, um, there is a query parameter, I think. Um, oh, wait a second. No, so it's, uh, right, it's gonna give me a 302. I wonder if if I can tell it what to look for in the condition. Um, as I notice, they mentioned in here, four, four success condition. I don't know if that applies to my case because that says HTTP proxy. Um, and I don't see any information about it here. Um, So I just have to look at the code because I don't think the explanation, the I don't think the documentation is going to talk about it. is I'm gonna say not my favorite code just browsing through this just the code to parse the options 
Um, doesn't make me thrilled, but it is what it is, I suppose. So they set a redirect flag. Oops, what am I doing here? Don't want to change this. What? Did not load the whole thing. A redirected flag. Well, let's let's just give it a shot. Uh, yeah. What am I? How am I doing this wrong? Um. It's called target, isn't it? I also done that wrong. This is always my fucking concern. Like, what I always do wrong with Hydra is I can't figure out the structure of the parameters they want to set. I know what I want to do with it. I know the information that I need to provide it. But the exact format of that information eludes me in some fashion. And I, like... The, their way of presenting documentation and it's not on them necessarily but the, the the manner in which they choose to present the documentation just breaks my brain in some fashion because i always find it incredibly difficult to figure out what i'm trying to figure out from their docs so like it seems like i should be saying HTTP post form colon slash slash the server is target pretty sure colon not colon port but according to this Like, These are the slash options, right? So slash and then login, whatever. So 
why does this is target not a thing? No, nope, that's definitely a thing. So wrong syntax. God damn it! <laughs> why do I persist in trying to use Hydra? I don't know. I do not know. Oh, it's the ant. Okay, that's my bad. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the problem is if I say invalid, right, it's going to consider all of them. What the hell? It doesn't have a way for me to tell it <sighs> that if it redirects in a certain way Sending cookies, it's fine. Maybe there are some settings that I need to choose related to. I don't know. Um, I'll add dash D. What is any of this? What is, what could, like, what? How is this meaningful information? What is this fucking tool, man?
What is this? I don't know what any of these things. Okay. Um. Sorry, I got the usual Twitch spam came in, and then I decided, oh, let me report this, and apparently I have to type a message to report a spam bot. I don't, I don't understand why you can't just say, click the button to say it's a spam bot and let somebody else look at the very obvious spam message and agree. But uh, so. Okay, so Tracker is an interesting page. Is it not loading? Oh, okay. Apparently all I needed to know was what the page URL is, but let's just, so we want the word Tracker in the results. Uh, I don't want all of that nonsense. Zero, what? At least one of them must have been valid because otherwise I wouldn't have seen this in the network traffic. And it literally has the word tracker right there. So why does it think zero of those were valid? Let me say, oh, oh, right, okay, sorry, it's S equals tracker, I guess, okay, but then it thinks all of them, yeah, so I don't, I'm just getting every almost everything is considered valid admin and password doesn't work uh, there should be 12 there's only 11 <sighs> right. um, so we can just go ahead and like get the flag but I don't feel great about that result and I never feel great about using Hydra, to be honest. Um, so if we go to just this page, and put an admin and password, that should not work, right? But if we put in root and boot, that also does not work. So that's my bad. I chose a word that okay let's look for the word airborne <laughs> airborne with an e there we go admin one two three four five is the one that works all right <laughs> I, I was not looking at this page when I was choosing the word tracker from the tracker page that's dumb and that gets us in okay Cool. So that's that one done. Uh, that could have gone a lot smoother. Maybe the next one. Did I miss anything in? No, okay. And presumably, you know, burp essentially has the same capability of just, let's, Send the same HTTP request, but change the form parameters according to how you define it. Oh, a fuzzing. Well, all right. 
This is sort of fuzzing, I guess. <laughs> We're going to use GoBuster. <laughs> We're going to be taking a look at some of the fundamental tools used in web application testing. You're going to learn how to use GoBuster to enumerate a web server for hidden files and folders to aid in the recovery of ELPS forums. Later on, you're going to be introduced to an important technique that is fuzzing, where you'll have the opportunity to put theory in, into practice. Our malicious, despicable, vile, cruel, contemptuous, evil hacker has defaced ELPS forums and completely removed the login page. However, we may still have access to the API. The sysadmin also told us that the API creates logs using dates with a format of year, month, day. Okay. To keep it simple, fuzzing can be argued as fancy brute forcing to some degree. However, you can fuzz what you can't brute force. Fuzzing is using security tools to automate the input of data we provide into things such as websites or software applications. Fuzzing is a an extremely effective process as computers can perform laborious tasks like trying to find hidden files slash folders, try different username and passwords much quicker than a human can, and it's willing to do. Poorly built applications are often unable to handle data that way it is supposed to under intense load. Moreover, the data we're parsing to the application may be interpreted and executed. Parsing? I think they mean passing to the application may be interpreted and executed instead of being handled correctly, i.e. system system commands. We can use fuzzing to cause the application to trigger what's known as an error condition where this may be abused by a penetration tester or a bug bounty hunter. So, I mean, I'm definitely of the opinion that fuzzing is a brute force based technique. You are doing a, well, okay, maybe, Maybe, yeah, maybe calling it a brute force based technique is the wrong way to look at it. You are attempting to do an automated search through the state space of whatever application you are applying fuzzing to. And there are varying techniques and amounts of, you could call it intelligence that you put into your fuzzing process. So you, in the case of fuzzing a binary application that you have the binary for, um, you can do uh, what is called coverage feedback. So you analyze the results of any particular fuzz case in terms of what code paths are followed, which locations within the code of the application are actually reached in that test case, that fuzz case, and then feed that information back into the generator for inputs and you know generally you do so in a way that biases towards generating inputs similar to or based on the one that reached further into the program reached some new location in the program with the idea that then you are fuzzing beyond that point rather than just blindly guessing new random inputs uh, but in both cases, they are about sort of wandering almost blind through the desert of available space within the application itself. And that is, you know, it's to me, it does count as a different kind of approach than doing a static or a manual analysis, where in the static case, you are attempting to use a mathematical um, construction based on the application you're looking at to essentially come to some conclusion about a particular relationship or circumstance between some parts of the application and other parts where that relationship indicates potentially a vulnerability um, I mean, that's putting it super broadly, but the idea is it's not, it's not just testing a bunch of stuff and trying to hit upon a test that happens, uh, to expose a vulnerability, but it is attempting to expose a vulnerability through an actual direct analysis of the content. And then manual is sort of doing that, but doing that like using your own brain power rather than uh, mathematical analysis, 
mathematics based uh, kind of analysis, let's say. Um, and but fuzzing is like it's a it's a subcategory of testing in the automated testing rather i should make that more clear it's a subcategory of automated testing so when you do software development you do lots of kinds of automated testing usually things like unit tests um and fuzzing is a sort of variety of automated testing that's about trying as many inputs as you possibly can hopefully um when when i talk about doing the more intelligent stuff really what that it means is you are attempting to reorder the sequence of random tests that you do in such a way that you are earlier hitting upon a test that is meaning that has a meaningful result um but ultimately if you were to run any kind of fuzzer for an infinite amount of time, you would, in theory, end up testing every possible input. So the intelligence and the fuzzing is really just about how quickly you are arriving at the inputs that you, that you care about, not whether or not you get inputs that are valid. So in the sense that fuzzing ultimately is about trying every possible input, and you don't actually do that, but for most real world applications you give up at some point um but that's fundamentally what the technique is about then it is akin to brute forcing brute forcing is just like the dumbest possible version of fuzzing so i think the idea of calling it fancy brute forcing is actually pretty accurate that's a long <laughs> way to go to come to that conclusion i guess a long rant about it but um and i and i think definitely things like gobuster fit into that category and are maybe in the realm of fancy brute forcing um, on the low end of intelligent fuzzing, basically, because it's really about guessing. Um, you're trying to get the right inputs early just by having a predetermined set of potentially good inputs, which is akin to having a good, um, maybe a good corpus for fuzzing, maybe a good input generator. But when I say good, I don't know. It's like the goodness in a, in a word list for GoBuster really derives from to what extent people are using standard names for things i guess basically i think there's a lot more intelligence that could be added into gobuster something akin to the equivalent of uh code coverage uh feeding back into the input generator but that's probably a discussion for another day and as you can see they're immediately talking about all of these different um they call them fuzz lists, I guess, here, but, you know, essentially they are just different word lists that people have co cobbled together. Uh, and some of them are probably pretty good. The, they're going to be better the more they are focused on a particular tool or, a, you know, like if you know that the web server that you're working with is Apache Tomcat, then having a word list specific to Tomcat is going to be a much better experience for you. All right. Um, and w fuzz, which I guess is like web fuzz. Maybe W fuzz is like an improved version of GoBuster in that it maybe takes that information. Um, So for example, let's say you're pen testing a note taking application and you want to see if you can view notes by other users. One way you may want to achieve this is by fuzzing for usernames with the knowledge that every valid user will have note.txt by default or wfuzz command 
would look would be like the following. So wfuzz-c-z file comma word list localhost colon 80 slash fuzz slash note.txt. So um, it's it's sort of akin to Hydra conceptually. I mean, hi, like Hydra is about logging into things, um, but in the case of HTTP, when you're doing like a form request, um, it's not fundamentally any different from what WFuzz is doing. It's just making a sequence of <coughs> apologies, making a sequence of HTTP requests and you fill in a spot where it will replace it with values from whatever word list you give. Hydra supports like user and password word list because again, it's authentication oriented, but the technologies underlying these things are exactly the same, I would say. Um, and you could probably build a system that achieves both what WFuzz does and what Hydra does in one design. And maybe Burp Suite does that, I guess. Um, now wfuzz will query the web server we're using yeah so it'll just fill in each entry from the word list into there that's nice um and maybe gobuster is not able to do that um it seems like it's like designed to fill in the last element of a path so you could put some prefix path for all of these but then the last thing is going to be one entry from this word list and one entry from the potential the, <coughs> the list of potential ex, uh, extensions. Be right back and get some water. So, I mean, but that might be, you know, me not understanding the full power of GoBuster. Um, but if it doesn't, then I guess WFuzz represents an improvement on that um, because you can construct, yeah, like this is basically doing the equivalent of what we just did with Hydra. So um, maybe what I'll do is almost the equivalent because we've only got one word list and it's using it to fill in both of these and that's probably uh, less optimal just because the overlap between usernames and passwords is the particular values uh, is not going to be that high I think um, so having different word lists for one and the other makes a lot of sense but it wouldn't be that I don't think it would be that huge of a extension on the concept underlying WFuzz. I don't know what the code is, so it might be difficult to actually achieve it as as an actual change to their code to support it. But you know, having multiple things that you can fill in different values from different word lists would be reasonable. Um, okay, so we. Okay, so we can just download there. Um, I'll just rename it. Okay, so deploy both the instance to ta attach to this task and the attack box by pressing the blue star button, blah, blah, blah. It's up to you to decide if you wish to create a word list for yourself or use theirs. I'm just going to use theirs and see if it works. If not, I guess we can find another word list. In summary, use the tools and techniques outlined in today's Admin of Cyber. You search for the API, find the correct post, and bring back ELF's forums. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. And go there. Let's see, you have been defaced. Your forms are gone. 
All right. And it doesn't load anything else, right? It does have an index.js. Is this going to, okay, that's just for this fancy tree. <laughs> cool. It is fancy. I mean, that's a nice animation. So I'll give them that. Um, but I, this doesn't help us towards the API. So, you know, can we just give it a shot? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't even need to use GoBuster or WFuzz. I can just check this out. Okay. So what do we get back from sitelog.php? Um, so we got back a 200, but it's just empty. Um, okay. Interesting. Uh, so do we want to find query parameters to give? So first, their question is, yeah, don't actually <laughs> attack whatever this site is. Um, just type in whatever the command would need to be. wfuzz dash f, or is it dash z? What does it say? And let's look at how they wfuzz dash uh, dash c dash f file comma big dot txt um, and then the URL uh, API dot php. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, this there we go okay and then so I didn't actually use GoBuster but you know it probably would have found slash API pretty quickly site dash log.php and fuzz the date parameter on the file oh. right I forgot they had mentioned the date um, That doesn't help us. Okay, so maybe we should use because um, I said it's year, month, day, the twenty-four, maybe. No. Okay. Um, so we need to fuzz basically the date parameter. Yeah. Oh. No, I see. Okay. Do I need to? Oh, they gave me a word list. Um, what's in the word list? Okay. So I don't have WFuzz installed. Let's give it a shot. Do. OK, 
Okay, so we're just getting it from some particular tag, I guess, um, from the Git repo on GitHub. Or, I mean, we're not getting it through the repo, but from GitHub based on the Git repo. And that looks fine to me. Okay, so hash z file day four word list. Um, Did I, or, oh, we found it in this date, 11.25. Yeah. All right, that went a little smoother, and if I know a username, so I'm not needing to use two different lists, then I think I'll definitely prefer WFuzz over Hydra just because I can remember the parameters a little easier. I think, I don't know. I know I have ranted about Hydra before in, in earlier on this stream, but it's just like, maybe it's just trying to be too many different, you know, support too many different services. And then they have this style of providing the parameters that is equivalent across all of them, or like they use the same style for all of them, but to the point where it confuses me, I don't know. All right, so we're gonna do SQL injection on this one, I guess. So we got two more, and then I will just tackle the networking, you know, start tackling the networking stuff on my next stream. I don't imagine that stuff will go as quickly as some of these have been going, just because I have far less experience with it. All right, after last year's attack, Santa and the security team have worked hard on reviving Santa's personal portal, hence Santa's Forum 2 went live. After the attack, logs have revealed that someone has found Santa's panel on the website and logged into his account. After doing so, they were able to dump the whole gift list database, getting all the 2020 gifts in their hands. An attacker, sorry, an attacker has threatened to publish a wishlist.txt file containing all information, but happily for us, he was caught by the CBI, the Christmas Bureau of Investigation, before that. On machine IP, colon 8,000, uh, oh, I guess that's going to be filled in in seven seconds. You'll find the copy of the website, and your goal is to replicate the attacker's actions by dumping the gift list. Task was created by Swapbox. Cool. So, set that as the box. And then we talk about what SQL injection is, how does it work, and how to do a login bypass if you can just get a condition that's always true um, and there you go okay so and then you can use SQL map and you can use SQL map and burp suite the challenge visit the vulnerable application of Firefox, find Santa's secret login panel and bypass the login. Use some of the commands and tools covered throughout today's task to answer questions number three through number six. 
Santa reads some documentation that he wrote when setting up the application it reads. Oh, this is in the like back in the story mode. Santa reads some documentation that he wrote when setting up the application. It reads, Santa's to do, look at alternative database systems that are better than SQLite. Also, don't forget that you installed a web application firewall after last year's attack. In case you've forgotten the command, you can tell SQL map to try and bypass the WAF by using dash dash tamper equal space to comment. Okay, I appreciate that explanation. I wonder if that's because they have like they couldn't turn that off on their thing and so they just got to be like okay look you're gonna have to just type this in otherwise you can't do the the challenge um i don't know all right so let's go to the site still nothing why does it want to connect Uh, port 80 is refused. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's port 8,000. Uh, that was not a backspace. There we go. All right, welcome stranger. This is the place to exchange your Christmas stories and wishes. So, I could look for links on here but I'm guessing it doesn't actually have any such thing so all right um should we do we get an indication of what web application it's just running unicorn so it's just like a flask or maybe um django site or something i think i think g unicorn is uh python fast cgi thing um okay so Installable CSS. And yeah, they don't even have a header. No, that's weird. That I didn't realize you could just put a style tag outside of the body or the head, but whatever. Um, okay, so nothing is going to work there. So, I'm going to slash login. Um, admin login. All right, we can. W fuzz it. Um, what the hell? Oh, uh, no, let's. How did we get a. Oh, yeah. Okay, so none of these are going to work. <laughs> because that's not the right word list to use. Checklist. Um, discovery web content directories. Medium. Directory list 2.3 dash medium, I guess. We found some stuff, but that was all just comments. 
Why is that even whatever? I guess because GoBuster will ignore the comments by default. Can I get it to only show me? This is interesting that there's like W5 seems quite a bit more capable and it's got like various ways of doing encoders and stuff. Um, what I'm just looking for is like, don't show me the failures. What, are, what printers are there? Probably like print to JSON or something. Um. And we can say dash HC 404. Be slower than GoBuster. I don't know. Um, so, secret login. I mean, we could try Santa's login. Okay. Obviously, I'm getting um, without using directory brute forcing. Oh. Well, okay. Let's see into a secret login panel. What am I supposed to understand from this page? Guess I should read it. Santa's official forum. Santa's forum is back. Welcome stranger. This is a place to exchange for Christmas stories and wishes. Latest comments, popular gifts, popular topics rather, are the gifts, uh, questions. None of these are links to anything. Um, there's no JavaScript. Like, unless there's something, I don't, I don't even see anything in the, style sheet as like a reference to an image directory or anything, so, okay. Oh, there is slash static. Never mind. Um, and you can see, yeah, that's the only thing that it got, I suppose. Which we had slash static. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, not it's not necessarily a directory in the sense of like 
pointing at you know, Pachi at a directory or something. It's probably not going to produce a directory listing, even if it is serving content from a particular directory on the server, because of the way a PHP server like this or a Python server like this works, I guess. Um, okay. Anything in comments? Not really. So let's think. Form login. Administrator. Well, it's not going to be PHP my admin, right? Because it's not PHP, it's not MySQL. <laughs> um, mm, find the secret login panel. Maybe I have not read something and that something is useful here. Admin panel. Uh, I mean, this is effectively brute forcing, so yeah, I don't know what I am like. Am I not going to have to use a hint? Uh, what should I be looking for on the site? What if I crash it in some way? Obviously the 404 page isn't getting me anything. Um, is there a good way to get a 500 error. Still, it's not the swap box, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, okay, I guess I'm going to look at a hint because I don't know what I'm thinking of. All right. Sure, Santa panel. I guess I, I should have just kept on that process, but I mean, that does feel like directory brute forcing pretty much um, okay but you know I, that's one skill that I'm not great at is just guessing directory names um, I should get better at that I guess okay so we do this uh, I've closed it now what does it look like we do a get request. No, sorry, this, we do a post request. Okay. Um, so this URL. Let's see if I can remember SQL map. Um, We went dash u target and that and P 
he his what, username and password was it? Yep. And then they give us that tamper space to comment. Should we just say Redirect. Oh, right, because page itself redirects. Um, okay. Let's see what the tables are, but I need to yeah so oh um Do no. We got five hundred errors. Interesting. Maybe I need to say yes and yes. Say yes to everything and see. Well, we'll, say, we'll go with the default for everything. get 
the same results. Um, Need to provide something. Okay. So who's gonna test? No, that's not helping us. Um. All right. Maybe I'm poorly using SQL Map. Oh, of course, I need to. Okay, <laughs> I just forgot that, like, easy peasy uh, injection. And I don't, I don't know how I need to be using SQL map to Give it. I guess maybe I could just skip those and let it find the. about a file from Burp Suite. Um, yeah, I don't know. These don't like why does it say it was gonna expire soon whatever um Okay, so that's weird. Okay. Uh, let's see into the panel. Okay. How many entries are there in the gift database? Well, it looks like four to me, but. Is there a car? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's my name. Um. Six, seven, eight, wait, <laughs> six, no, three, <laughs> six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-two. What did Paul ask for? Uh, where's Paul? 
<laughs> yeah, that's why not. And what is the flag? All right, so it's not in the gift database, it would seem. Um, We can go ahead and do it that way, I guess. What is the admin's password? Um, why does it think search is not injectable? Does that do anything? Just guessing with the five. Um, okay, so if we aren't going to use SQL map for it. We want to um, Can get nothing, presumably. What? And a two. Okay. Rather we get the error messages out of this, that makes it a lot nicer. Okay. don't understand how I'm misusing SQL map here. What is it actually trying? Okay. 
I don't feel like I needed to use space to comment. When I was doing it. Am I misremembering something here? Yeah, that's that's fine. So That also seems to work fine. Why does it think these are failing? Get parameter search does not appear to be what why do they think it's not stable? Or not dynamic rather. Oops. Okay. 
can't. Okay. I mean, I'll put it back on there. Space to. But it still doesn't think it's injectable. Should I tell it to not care about that as the DBMS? Maybe they changed it is what they're saying, but. I mean, if this is the. Just don't know what they're expecting from some of these payloads. Ultimately, <sighs> so I guess we'll be doing it manually. Maybe this one I will watch the video afterwards because I, I don't know how I'm supposed to be using SQLite differently to do this. Um, So shouldn't be greater than a hundred, right? still getting everything. Right. Is the password really? Was my machine time expired? I'm still on this machine. Yeah, I've got over an hour. Okay. Um, this so what does that get us that just gets us everything oh maybe that's maybe that's why okay 
what if we try it with so I think maybe no I don't know no it's still don't like it So, okay, but it should be greater than one. Interesting. Why did that change? Why did that not? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Get something for that? No. So I'm just trying to like verify that we can get the length of the password. Just go to the actual documentation. Binary operator, or no, sorry, we want probably a binary operator. Um, okay, here we go. Right, we've got greater than less than, okay. So, hmm. Simple function include length.
where is my syntax going wrong? Um, Okay, so it's one based. Do something like warped six 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 youth. Are you winning? Um, not on this one. I'm I'm sort of not necessarily struggling, but it's going like I know what I need to do. It's just going to be tedious because I. Normally would do a SQL injection with a tool that does a lot of the tedious stuff for me, but I wasn't able to get that working in this case for some reason that I don't understand. So now I'm doing the tedious stuff myself. Um, how do I do a limit on a select in SQLite? Limit one, okay, at the end. Oops. Hmm. I don't like that that didn't give me an error. <laughs> I was really hoping that would give me an error. Because we should be saying or select everything from, and then the, I guess the table name being the results of this query. Where's the from in here? Table or subquery? Or we could do a select statement, okay. So, Is it just not going to give me an error when the like oh I see it's using the results of the select statement 
doesn't help me. Um, I'm pretty sure. Wait. Oh, maybe I can just join. We're going to specify to join. It's a compound over here. Okay. There we go. Just taking the hard route. Uh, no. Okay. Where was the? table. All right. Just select everything, please. Okay. got one more I think after this in the web exploitation category that one was nice I, I want to watch dark stars video because I want to find out if he actually used SQL map um, given the situation for this um, I don't know I was like planning to go through the route that SQL map sometimes does where it will like brute force values if it only has like a yes or no possible outcome where it, like it can't get the um, data directly basically but I'm glad that I decided to try the more straightforward path of like let me just union on another query and then I can do whatever query I want I can select names of tables or I can select uh, values within other tables and all that. So I'm curious if that's, if Darkstar just did it uh, in that in that style or if he actually got SQL map to work because I, I want to know what I was doing wrong with SQL map, I guess. Uh, but I'm going to move on to day six for now, and then maybe I'll watch that video after the stream. You can obviously go find and watch it yourself if you're curious. All right. This year, Santa wanted to go fully digital and invented a Make-A-Wish. I feel like I'm a little quiet right now. Uh, invented a Make-A-Wish system. It's an extremely simple web app that would allow people to anonymously share their wishes with others. Unfortunately, right after the hacker attack, the security team was discovered, has discovered rather, that someone has compromised the Make-A-Wish app, presumably, system, whatever. Uh, most of the wishes have disappeared and the website is now redirecting to a malicious website. An attacker might have pretended to submit a wish and put a malicious request on the server. The security team has pulled a backup server for you on such and such IP address. I forgot to deploy it. So let's go ahead and do that now. And your goal is to find the way the attacker could have exploited the application. Okay, another one by Swafox. This is gonna be a cross-site scripting challenge. So we'll have to throw in a little bit of JavaScript. 
Um, okay, so this one is going to take more than five minutes. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Mitigating XSS, uh, sanitizing is good, certainly, um, but it could be quite difficult to get it just right. And honestly, like if I were a developer, what I would try to do is use the uh, mechanisms that exist in HTTP slash HTML to tell the browser to only allow JavaScript in like the head tag. Um, because effectively XSS involves like on, on a fundamental level requires controlling the ability to put JavaScript into the body of the HTML. Uh, I mean, I guess in theory, you, you could have a web application that results in it going in somewhere in the head tag. Um, I don't think it matters if you get it in the title. I don't think any browser is willing to accept JavaScript content that's been put in the title somehow. Um, and I think it's a relatively straightforward thing to ask your developers not to allow user input to influence what goes into the head tag. So then you're left with user input influencing stuff that goes into the body. And if you can simply tell the browser, don't treat anything that goes in there like JavaScript, then on top of any sanitizing, um, if they do manage to bypass your filters, um, the browser still shouldn't allow them to be running JavaScript in there, I think. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of that it's like uh, content policy or something content security policy um, and it it's you know provided with HTTP headers um, yeah so this is really what I would consider the number one thing you should do. And then filtering and, and sanitizing on top of it is a good idea. Uh, but like there's, there's, I think, you know, and you can prevent them from allowing somebody to load scripts and other things uh, from various sites. So you can, you can specify what sites are allowed for the content. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do with the content security policy, but like, it just feels like this is more directly specifying what you, uh, what limits you wanna place on how the website that you've provided can work. The problem is like most developers method of uh, building their sites involves like cobbling together a lot of stuff. So it might, you know, these might not be possible unless you have really broad control over everything that goes onto your site. So if you're somebody like Google, you're in a position to use something like this because Google's not like taking random adware systems and, in, you know, inserting it into their page at some layer that's in a completely automated thing. Cause you bought an off the shelf ad platform or whatever. And, you know, and this and that other thing that just like ends up resulting in a website with a, that's the, you know, Frankenstein of like five or six different mechanisms uh, and, and you know you only control one or two of them or something and then your attempt to say everybody has to follow this policy doesn't work because the 
the third party stuff doesn't work that way, for example. But if you're Google, that's not how you, you know, Google engineers are ultimately responsible for everything that ends up on that page, whether they be working in the Google ads system um, or whatever, you know, the, the accounts management system or the uh, whatever team actually controls the page in question. Um, ultimately, they can make everybody follow uh, methods that would allow them to use content security policy. So it might be easy to say this is the thing that you should go for first, but it's not always reasonable in every content or every context, I guess. I don't know. Um... Okay. Do, 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 do. Let's see if it's ready now. Is it not on its own five thousand? Cool. Sorry. <laughs> Let's just try the basic, you know. All right, well that works. So, what are we looking for here? Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, we run it. Um, what vulnerability type was used to exploit? Okay. That's a good question. Um, something, something, injection, okay, something injection maybe? Um, Is the parameter not comment? Interesting. Guess Q. Oh, I see. So if we did like, so let's just do it in here. So we can use Q to do a reflected, what, oh, sorry. Um, and then the rest of this is like run this particular program and tell me the results of its automated scanning. It's not a lot of fun. Um, force this is it two because it's both of the entries <laughs> uh, it'll make an alert appear yeah yeah okay well then the question is what vulnerability type is it but it's not cross-site scripting because <laughs> that doesn't match the the pattern there um, Uh, 
I don't, it's not going to be reflected. Uh, so this is another area where I'm like, it's not, it's not really my strong suit to know the exact names that have been given to these different uh, variations of web attacks. So I'm just sort of skimming through this to see if there's anything that pops out to me as like potentially the name of a store, maybe. Hey, there we go, stored cross-site scripting. Um, which is to say, okay, so there's, no, there's not actually a flag that we can get. In a system like this, if I saw this in a CTF or whatever, uh, there would be a, another service that the, the challenge builder, organizer, whatever, is running, which represents an admin user or something um who is hitting this site and then if we do a stored cross-site scripting kind of attack we upload our our payload through the our whatever request is vulnerable to the xss and then that other service ends up hitting the page and downloading it and then our payload runs on that services fake browser uh, so we would want to do an xss that causes them to hit to actually make a request out to you know some uh some endpoint that we control and ideally the request that it makes will include useful information so what i've seen before is like okay we can make it try to instead of put in an alert or something because an alert doesn't really do anything other than make it very obvious that you've triggered an XSS. Um, maybe you have an attempt to load an image or load some content in the URL you provide is the one that where you control the endpoint. Uh, but the way that you craft the URL for it, you make it use JavaScript to like include the cookie data. So then it takes the cookie data from their browser when they run your XSS payload and it sends it along with the request and then you have the cookie data and you can log in using that cookie effectively or impersonate them with the cookie. Uh, but in this case, they don't have, I don't think they have something like that set up. So all you can do is really show that it's vulnerable by getting it to make an alert on your own page on your own in your own browser because there's no hypothetical other person accessing this service since it's a custom deployed service in this uh, uh, virtual in the VPN that we have set up rather all right um, so that's all of the web exploitation days and we've got another six days of network stuff uh, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to find out if they continue with networking after day twelve, or if they move on to uh, some other category. But on the next stream, we will start with the networking ones. With uh, day seven, the Grinch really did steal Christmas, which appears to be because I, I was curious. I looked at it earlier in the stream, and it's probably going to be reviewing. Um, a capture of uh, IP traffic and we'll try to you know discover some useful signal from there something like that so that's gonna be interesting uh, hopefully I will have some time to stream that stuff tomorrow but either way have a great one uh, check out the try hack me advent of cyber if you're interested in learning about cybersecurity and catch you on the next stream.